welcome everybody. We're going to pass over now to John Atherton, who will lead us in this discussion. Hi, and we have our first question, which I'm going to answer as we're going, which is, uh, is, this is this relevant to just co-ops or I'm from a community benefit society? Yes, it's relevant to anybody. To be honest, a lot of what we're talking about will be relevant to anybody who essentially engages any form of member. Um, so yeah, if you're a co-op community benefit society or other sort of community business and you've got members, this is probably relevant for you. Um, so yeah, without further ado, uh, engaging your members from Co-ops UK. Um, if we can move to the next slide, go. Yeah, uh, so what we're going to cover today, uh, quick introductions from uh, the team here at Cops UK. Then I'm going to do um, a bit of, spend a bit of time on really some core concepts around membership and membership engagement, just to kind of give us uh, a bit of a, a foundation really to our conversation. Um, then we're going to move into a discussion on meaningful interactions and what, what we all mean by meaningful interactions with members. Um, get a chance to do a poll and discussion going with with people on the uh, webinar. Then we'll move into some top tips, some quick fire tips from uh, me and the team here at Co-ops UK. And then over to you if uh, other people want to share their tips from from their cooperatives and how uh, the community businesses and how they engage uh, members. Then we'll move into an open surgery, which is your opportunity to post questions, comments, um, and we'll do our best to answer those questions. Anything we can't answer, uh, always a, a long and interesting conversation we may take offline and cover at a later date with you. And then obviously we'll wrap up and tell you about next steps and assume that we will share all the tips and, uh, and any actions out of this webinar uh, afterwards. Thank you, Gareth, move on. Next slide. So, um, oh, back one. So this is the uh, membership team at Co-ops UK, if you can see it on the screen. Uh, I'm in the middle uh, wearing another blue jumper and hair just as dishevelled as it is there. That's, that's lockdown for you. <laughs> My name's John Atherton and I'm head of membership at Co-ops UK. I've been here for getting on 12 years now. And then next up we have, uh, Irina, do you want to introduce yourself? I'm Irina Piston. I've now been at Cooperatives UK for two years. Uh, my background is a, a corporate background, I apologise for that, um, and even worse in PR and marketing and communications. So I come at this from a, a kind of heavy communications angle, but really pleased to be here and absolutely passionate about cooperatives, complete convert. So thanks. Uh, Gareth? Um, so I'm Gareth. I've been with Coach UK for eight years, um, engaged with members on a day to day basis around all sorts of um, queries and potential issues that they may have and also go out and meet a lot of members face to face direct either at their place of business or offices and um, also host some of our co-op connections local networking events which have now moved online. Great so we'll move on to some core concepts of membership. Um, so I apologise beforehand the other joy of Covid is uh, my hand drawn illustrations to go with the webinar so hopefully you can uh, read the handwriting and I'll explain them as I go. Um, so really at the absolute core of membership and membership engagement is behaviour, it's the changing behaviour of, of your members, your users, your, your customers and really just to kind of mention that right at the start that you know every from a membership point of view most starts of that behaviour or that action comes from a point of need, you know your member will want something, will need something. Uh, and particularly with our members, that's usually from the point of view of confusion or advice and support they need. And really how you interact with how you, uh, that first point of contact and that first experience they have moved back uh, with them affects future uh, relationships and future iterations on that behavior. And so really just to really reinforce right at the start that you know your member does need something from you that's why why they're a member um, and whether you're in contact with them through events through phone calls through through your website your social media present presence through email or through face to face if they have a bad experience and they and that experience goes badly and you may not even know it goes badly they will they will walk they will lessen their uh, want and their behavior to engage with you and it will be harder and harder for them to engage with you in the future because you've essentially disengaged them from that first contact 
if you have a great experience, if they have a great experience of you, uh, whether it was a friendly face, a really supportive uh, initial email, or uh, the, the, the event or webinar was uh, very useful, then they're happy. You've satisfied their need. Um, you've made an impact, a positive impact on them. And so when it comes back round for the next time they need you as a co-op or a community business, um, they're that much more likely to engage with you because the last experience they had was so positive. So first impressions absolutely do count. And you, and by building up good contact experiences over time, it means that engaging them in the future becomes easier and easier. Although, although that's what the theory says. Moving on to the next slide. It's a really interesting graph explaining a bit more on where I'm kind of going with this, this core point of engagement, which is to get a behavior change, to get somebody to do something, it really comes down to two points. How motivated are they to do it? How, how much of a problem do they have that you're going to solve? Or how excited are they in your calls? Uh, or aligned with, with what you want to do as, a, as an organization? And if their motivation is incredibly high, they will probably put up with quite a lot of effort uh, to, to be involved and to engage. Whereas if their motivation is very, very low, it's just buying something from the shop or, or there's lots of other things they could do, then if you still have a high bar of effort, they probably won't engage. And so really, see membership engagement on this sort of spectrum of, of how easy is it for a member to engage with you? and how much motivation do they have to engage with you? And you can't, and you have to balance those two things out. So in other words, the easier you can make it for them to engage with you, the less you have to sell, the less you have to really motivate them to engage. Or if you know that something is quite a hurdle to get over, um, applying for membership or, or all the rest of it, then you have to work that much harder to engage them in it to get them over. And that's the final point on this slide, which is, even at the point at which your, your motivation, their, their motivation to engage and the amount of effort it takes to engage is about right, they still need a trigger point to jump over. So you've got to imagine they've come up to that, if you see that red line as a fence, they've got up to the fence and to actually engage with you, they've got to climb over that fence. They've got to do a little bit of a, an extra bit of effort to get over and then once on the other side of that, they're kind of, you're kind of away with them then, they'll engage with you. So both think about, in every, every piece of contact you have with a member, does the effort they have to expel um, warrant their level of motivation to get involved? And if that's about right, what's the trigger you're gonna do to make them go, actually, yeah, actually, yeah, I will come to that event or uh, respond to that email or, or, or go and shop there. And just think about those, those two things. So that's the, some core concepts of membership. Moving on to the next slide. Something you might have come across if you've done your own research around uh, membership and membership engagement is uh, the ladder of engagement or the ladder in participation. And, and it's very true, it's, you know, there's loads of research out there uh, around this. And, it, and it's kind of building on the, the point I've made before that it's very unlikely that you're gonna, if your first engagement with a member is trying to get them to be on the board of your cooperative or, or to do something that takes a lot of effort, don't be surprised that they won't do it because the amount of effort they have to expel, the amount of risk and investment they have to make to do that activity is just too, too great. It's, it's, it's too great for them to do. And very few people will take that much of a risk or invest that much in something without knowing what's gonna happen. And so usually what you would like to do with any, um, any member is break up that journey in a way and start out and look at all the things you want to engage a member in and work out what you should do first to get them, to warm them up essentially, to get them engaged at a low level in an easy to do thing that's, that, that's less risk, reputational risk for them or financial risk for them. That's easy to do and get them involved in that. And then when they've had a great experience of that, you then move them over to the next level. What's the next thing that's a bit harder, a bit more of an investment and, and then so on and so forth. And eventually you may well find the next leaders and directors of your cooperative in the future. And so this ladder of uh, engagement is what that's really about. And so the way I break this down, and you can break this down in many different ways for many different situations, um, 
is it starts with awareness. So actually for a lot of us, your members just being aware of you, just being conscious of your news, what you offer, what they could get involved in if they wanted to get involved in. Even keeping abreast of what you do as, a, as an organisation takes a level of investment um, and, and, and engagement. And so really, that's the first thing. Are your members aware of what you do? The next level is, do they associate with what you do? So they're aware of what you do and they actually like it. They actually tell other people. They actually say, oh, yes, I'm a member of or I did this. And, and they're happy to associate with you as an organization and associate that they're a member of you. And that's a next level of, uh, of engagement in your organization. The next level beyond that tends to be a comment or a criticism. So, you know, yes, they, they, they like you on social media, they follow you on social media uh, and things like that. But when do they actually comment or reply or retweet uh, what you're doing? When do they actually complain or criticise what you're doing? It shows a, a low level, you know, they've got some sort of buy into what you do. They're not going to uh, contribute heavily, but just a comment or a criticism, a challenge shows you that next level of engagement. And you really should be um, asking for those, you know, positive and negative feedback. Then one of the uh, core areas I suppose a lot of us want to get our members into, it's that really active contribution and participation, coming to an event, buying something, um, producing, helping you produce, helping you volunteer, whatever it is in your cooperative or community business where you know, the member is physically and actively doing something. Uh, and that's, that's what we're all aiming for really, but to get there, you have to go through those other phases. And then finally, once you've got members who are contributing, you know, next, actually, they want to start having a say. They want to be co-designing or co-creating or leading and actually putting themselves forward for position like uh, being a director or, or on a committee and things like that. And so really be aware of that, that ladder of engagement. And just realise that, that the further you go up, the more effort it takes and therefore the more motivation that member needs to have. So everything you can do to make their motivation, to, to improve their motivation, but equally make, make them feel like it's not so hard, that actually they've already done so much. Um, there's a great load of work around the sunk cost fallacy, which basically says the more people invest in something, um, the more they're willing to do it because they've already invested so much. And actually, if people realise, that's usually this case with volunteering, if people realise at the start of their volunteering journey what volunteering would entail, they would never volunteer in the first place. It's just they got so far down the line and so invested in that organisation that actually they've done more than they ever expected. And so that's generally what a ladder of engagement looks like. And it's also being mindful that the ladders of engagement will be different for different people. So for some people, they will find it really easy, like an elevator engaging in some parts of what you do and other parts of what you do, they will find really hard um, and differently for different people. So, for example, some people love a meeting. You know, they might be retired. They might not have um, many responsibilities at home so they can give up an evening and come to a meeting. That's not a huge issue for them. Um, whereas somebody else, that's just really hard. They, they, they just could not give up an evening or a weekend because because of their time and on the flip side getting engaged digitally somebody might find it really hard to engage in a technological and digital way just because that's not the way they operate and, and it's a it's a concern and a risk for them whereas somebody else a younger person it's not an issue they can use any platform in any way and they'll pick it up so just being mindful that all of your members and users are very different and how they what they will find hard is different for different audiences can we move to the next slide? And so final, this is, I suppose, more of a tip really than, uh, than a concept. It's knowing that all of that users and members are very different than each other and knowing that within your organization, you'll have very different ways of engaging with members. It's really useful to do an activity called, uh, you know, user journey mapping. Um, or, you know, when you, when you Google it, Google customer service, or customer journey mapping or user journey mapping uh, rather than member mapping and what this really is is it's an opportunity as a as a team within your organization to really map out some of those member relationships and, and i think it's a really useful activity to do so i'll quickly go through it uh, essentially what you do is you get uh, the people closest to the members in a room 
and even better, some actual members as well, but that's not always the case. And you map out a journey. So it could be anything. It could be engaging in an event. It could be uh, joining whatever, whatever you want to do, but try and have a distinct journey with a start and an end point. So at COPS UK, a classic ex example for us is um, a member joining throughout the year we serve them and at the end of the year they renew. And so that would be the journey we'd take a member on. Then what you do in, in, in using a workshop format is you put on a big whiteboard all the activity, the contact points you have with that member. And by that I mean print off the emails, print off the web pages, um, put actual examples throughout the, the journey of what they, what they will see and how they will interact with you. What's your process you're following? And put that at the, st at the top, really, if you're doing this on a, a flip chart or a whiteboard. Then think about the why. So you've got your processes written down. Why do members engage with you? And why do you want members to engage with you at each of those phases? And have a think about that. And then the most important part of this workshop is to track actual experience from members, which is why it's great to have members in the room. Or if you can't have members in the room, collect loads of data on actual behavior from members or, or quotes or testimonials from members and track what, they, what you think or what they tell you they think they're feeling and experiencing throughout that member journey with you and so you you will plot that on usually between you know minus minus 10 to plus 10 and you track that and if, if you've got the image up you can see there's a red line where i've i've plotted and, and tracked it and what this is really useful for is you can marry how you think members are feeling and experiencing you and, and their journey with you against the actual bits of contact they've had with you and it's a really good way of analyzing whether a specific email or a specific process you can improve because at that point in the journey members are not as happy and so you can do this for multiple different user journeys and at Coops UK this is what we would do um, and we will take time every so often to unpick uh, a piece of engagement we're having with members and trying to work out why they didn't engage in it or why it was massively successful and they didn't engage in it and so doing a, a member journey exercise is really useful so that's it for uh, some core uh, membership concepts hopefully that's giving you some uh, food for thought um, we're now going to move into a bit of a, a discussion piece that Gareth's going to lead so following on from John's concepts there, we want to think a little bit more about the actual interactions that we have with members and how and why they might be meaningful to us as a co-op, to us as an organisation. Um, Irina, can you introduce the next slide? Wonderful, thank you. So to kick this off, let's actually run a poll and see if we can get uh, an idea of everyone's thoughts on this. So. Irene's going to launch the post, uh, sorry, the poll even, and you can respond with three answers. So the question we're asking is, what member interactions are most meaningful to you? We'll leave this up for a, a moment or so, or until at least we get a good amount of responses that we can draw something from it. So hopefully on your screens, you should have seen the poll pop up. If you can select as many as you think are relevant to your co-op, and the interactions that you have with your members. And by all means, if there's um, interactions that we don't mention there, stick them in the chat. Of course, yeah, continue to use the, the chat and the Q&A. So just about half have voted, so we'll just wait a little bit longer as um, as people start voting more. So interesting results coming in, which we'll share. Um, from the q and I'll try and speak a little bit louder as well. <laughs> All right, um, Lucy's saying that she can only select the one, not multiple. Ah, apologies. If you select the most important, then we'll we'll go from there. Sorry. Just a, a few more we're waiting for to hear from. Give you a little bit more time. Okay, I think we'll probably call it a day there and end the poll. Okay. 
Okay, and in some respects, not by surprise, um, the most me uh, the the member in in interactions that are most meaningful you are <clears throat> AGMs and meetings. So, you know, the, a core part of being a, a co-op member is is taking part. It's being involved, and none more so than uh, end of year annual annual general meeting or perhaps a, a monthly members meeting. Um, I suppose why we tried to, to bring this up and to focus on this is you only have a certain amount of time to engage um, your members and trying to think about what is most effective in how you do engage them, what's, what's most cost effective, getting uh, bang for the buck as it were, and how much effort does this actually involve? Um, you know, running a, an AGM, depending on the amount of members that you have, can be a huge endeavour. Um, as I know certainly with our AGM coming up and the, the shift to that being a more online um, mm -hmm. event this year, that has meant a lot of uh, time and effort and thinking has had to go on into mm -hmm. how we actually shift that. And um, certainly the thinking about this is an essential function that we have to run there and we know that it's meaningful to, to both us and our members in terms of how they, they ta take part in it. Um, mm -hmm. Close second, I think we've got there two social media. Uh, Zoom meetings since the lockdown, um, a, a closing of um, spaces, outlets, um, opportunities to actually meet face to face. So, by you know, no surprise there, Zoom meetings. I think from conversations that I'm having with our members now, um, we've all moved very quickly, and a lot of our members have also made that transition to online very quickly. It's been a, a necessary evil and a, and a, a means to an end for us. So, um, we've seen a really sharp uptake in members, member co choosing to use um, Zoom meetings. And I think some of the learning from this is that those that have found it easier than others are now thinking about how they utilize this and try and engage with members in the future. Because I, I know it's it certainly can be difficult to try and attend lots of different events and be in many places all at the same time. So travel being taken out of the equation allowing members to, to to join in and to engage online is now providing us with um, opportunities to engage with those who might not necessarily have got involved with us um, uh, Gareth sorry John John's raised his hand uh, just as part of this um, poll discussion who just wants to say something anybody else who wants to raise their hand uh, following John please do we can bring you in no problem Yes, I was just going to say it'd be great to get other people's uh, thoughts on why why they put AGM um, up. Um, as a as a membership person for twelve years, AGMs are the what's the word the bind of all of our lives, I think, uh, and it's something uh, um, that that we all struggle with. I was in a a, a really liberating conversation with uh, Nationwide of all, of all of all organisations, and they've consciously decided really that the AGM is not the central point of their engagement with members it's it's a process that has to take place and they do it but actually they've decided that they're going to shift more of that sort of engagement into other meetings and, and tours where the chief executive goes around and, and, and tours in much smaller shorter meetings and they found uh, it's a much better way of of trying to engage the members rather than to shoehorn lots of different interactions into one solitary event like an AGM. So it's a, this is one of the reasons why we pose this question is a, what, what meaningful, what's meaningful to you as an organization? And, and we'll go on to uh, another poll afterwards. Is that's the key thing, you know, an AGM is very much of interest to secretaries of cooperatives and community venture societies. And I think as, as membership, people with the focus on members always be mindful of uh, of that um, but anyway i'm rambling does anybody else have any comments they want to come back with or thoughts in terms of um agms we put it as a we work with housing cooperatives and we put it as a stipulation within uh, their pre-tenancy that they uh, participate in agms so it's our opportunity to engage with members thank you any other ones that you would have chosen if you could have done uh, probably social media because we do a lot of engagement through social media. Thank you. So we've been thinking about what interactions are most meaningful to you, your co-op, your organisation, but of course members members come first. And so what what flipping this on its head, what do we think are the interactions that are most meaningful for your members? I'm going to run another poll. It will just be the one answer then, I'd imagine. So to clear that up. So it's quite a similar list, but we're just asking you to flip this on on its head to the side. Perhaps think with your your own member 
co-op hat on and um, how you interact with co-ops that you'll remember of. Okay, so the results are in then. Um, top one there, direct phone calls and emails, closely followed by um, joint second pre-COVID events, conferences face-to-face -face, and the social media. Um, I think thinking about meaningful engagement with members here, this is going back to John's uh, concepts and the behavioural change breakpoints in that a member's motivation compared to the amount of effort that it takes to actually get involved and to engage something is, is really crucial to that, um, that meaningful engagement there. Um, the direct phone calls and emails there, I know it's not exactly, um, it's not something that every cooperative can do. Sometimes interactions are very much just um, over the counter or in a space of, of work or or where, wherever your cooperative um, operates out of there. But I think in some respects, this is a, a missing part of engagement that some co-ops are often overlooking, that um, you know, having that, that quick, short phone call to try and um, help a member or to, to gain insight in what they need and, and why they're wanting to engage or are already engaging is, is really crucial. So what's useful, if you are doing research around the topic, a lot of general marketing and comms research is is applicable to membership and so there's a lot of research that says um people people engage both for transactional reasons you know a direct transaction of value they need something they get something from you but also emotional and emotive reasons for for why they would engage with you and i suppose what we what we tend to find at cops uk and it might be the same in your organization is you tend to hook people with a transactional relationship um, the, the specific piece of value they get from you but what keeps them in membership for longer is that is that emotional physical contact and so we know at Coach UK that if a member attends a physical event or has a physical face-to-face -face chat with, with with us they they get that much more of a bond and so it's it, within your organization it's it's working out actually and again going back to that point at the start what really easy things and simple things can you get people engaged with to start with but because you know you're building up to harder things like events or physical face-to-face -face, but the payoff and the reward for for those those harder um, engagements really do pay off um, as long as obviously the, the whole underlying point for all of this is the the the, the contact they have with you is positive uh, and a, a positive experience rather than negative experience obviously those that have um replied direct phone calls uh, nine of you do you have any views on why you know that's important to your members and perhaps um didn't wasn't as important on our first poll um i think it's that instant contact that they can have with somebody do you know what i mean so um you know whether it's a phone call or an email um we're we're a service provider so we're a managing agent to several housing cooperatives do you know what i mean so mm. i think it's that kind of reassuring instant contact that they that they can have with somebody and if if um you think members actually do see this as one of the most um, important contacts with us. Do you think as organisations we're putting in as many resources as possible in terms of that side of um, our engagement? Um, yeah, I think we are. I think we're doing as much as we can in terms of, you know, uh, we do explore other avenues as well of engaging with members, but I think um, particularly direct phone calls and emails, I think that's, that's probably one of the most important um, things that they expect from us really in terms of being able to get in contact with us and, and having that sort of instant contact. Philip Coventry? Oh, yeah, we've certainly felt like it would be really nice to just be picking up the phone a lot and speaking to our members and trying to find out how they're doing at the moment. But it's just been really difficult to find the time and we keep talking about it, but then not finding the time to do it. And um, I don't I don't have any answers. It's just that I do recognise that as um, a really tough one because it sort of seems like that gives the ones who receive that phone call a really kind of clear experience that we reached out to them. But um, at the same time, it is a very laborious, so it would eat up a lot of staff time trying to do it. So um, we haven't kind of cracked it, but uh, I think it would be, it's, it sort of feels really desirable, but yeah, we, we haven't found a way to make it a sort of systematic approach. Yeah, John, did you want to say something? Yes, I suppose it's more of a top tip, I suppose. Um, we, we are moving on to top tips in a minute, but um, one of the things we're going to look to do at Corpse UK more is we do a lot of member calls, but we have uh, over 800 members now. And so we're probably going to instigate um, monthly or weekly kind of end of the week webinar chats. So now everyone's very au fait with Zoom, then we'll probably start to 
particularly new members as they join, invite them to take part in a bit of a conversation where they can meet the membership team and 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 actually other new members as well. And so it's a great way of of using time efficiently. So rather than having to phone, have lots and lots of one-to-one -one engagements with lots of members, by doing something like a Zoom call or a webinar, you can have one-to-many relationships, which is just a little bit more time efficient for your staff. And actually the member probably gets as much value out of it because they both talk to the, the member of staff, but they also talk to other new members or other members in a similar situation to them. So I think, I know we're looking at um, doing more of those sorts of like, one-to-many conversations and calls um, that might just be informal. You know, they don't have to be structured webinars or anything. That's a bit of a top tip. Just, just to quickly come in on, on the phone calls and, and you know, trying to engage members one-to-one. -one. Um, in recruitment, we talk about member get member, um, but also, you know, depending on the, the size type structure of your co-op, members talking to members may happen at an AGM or a meeting or in the place of work in the, uh, the, the shop, the outlets, wherever it is. So I know certainly from some of the mutual aid groups, they've been looking at organising calls from either certain areas or certain interests. And, and so it might even be worth off, um, looking at the option in the same way as the NHS volunteers were potentially going to do so in, in, in members talking to other members or more engaged members trying to reach out and engage with other members. So um, I've not really heard of many exploring it, but it's, you know the potential is there. We, we don't know how long the, the long-term lockdown and the implications of that are going to go on. Okay, so um, top tips from our perspective or my perspective. As I said, I'm from a PR and communications um, background. And I've also done uh, lots of different things like own cafes as well. And this was before I knew um, enough about cooperatives. Um, but now, in, and in hindsight, if I was running a small business again, and it could be anything, it could be a cafe, because that's what I've done before, um, but it could be a bookshop, it could be any kind of small organisation, it could be office bound, um, it could be a venue, I know there's some energy groups on the line, um, swimming pools, um, whatever it is that you um, run. If I was doing my cafe again, I know that I would go mad on the co-op element. So it, to the point where I would be in touch with Co-ops UK and I'd be asking them for 50 of their finest posters and I would literally wallpaper one wall in my cafe with those posters. And I know it seems odd, but when you come from a kind of guerrilla PR background of mine, these are the discussion points in your premises that lead very much to the right conversations that get you members. And as everyone knows who's starting a business, you've got your kind of four to eight people, founding members, who are absolutely trying to make this business the best that it can be, get heavily involved in the operational side of things, and then you realize the co-op or the social um, enterprise element and messaging starts to wane a bit because everyone's doing the business. I know how that feels, but it's the element of the co-op messaging that is absolutely crucial and you've probably just lost your best advocates of that message because they're all embroiled in the business so use your premises use your um what you where you are as your talking points um so i, I would definitely go big on the co-op element it would be the thing about my cafe that's more important than the best coffee that we sell it's the thing that i'll always be uh, keep talking about and then it, when you start the conversation, I would be always saying, but we need more members. We can't do this without you. So this is the nudge technique on explaining why this cafe or this work um, that you do, this office, this swimming pool, what would be happening in your area if you weren't around? And we all know a little bit of the nudge technique on the, our texts that we get from um, hospitals or, our med or medical centers, which say, if you don't make your appointment, that's gonna cost the NHS 160 pounds. Well, now in COVID times, we know that that's not something we want to cause um, a, a difficulty with the NHS. It makes you want to go to your, um, your appointments. It makes you not want to let people down. So it's just looking at the similar sort of nudge techniques in order for us to engage our members to come to our events, um, get involved in our meetings, and just want to be with us in terms of time, whether it's money or time, you just want to nudge them in that direction. So think of the equivalent nudges for your organisation is what I would say in order to get members to engage. Thanks, Irene. Gareth, what are your two tips? 
So from me, um, this comes from experience and day-to-day and -day anyway, that is never presume that you know what your members want. Um, I remember making this mistake some years ago and then spending a couple of days regretting what I'd said and how I'd engaged with that member. And it was because I, I had, had heard something and I presumed myself what their actual need was. So regardless of whether this is a new member that's recently joined or someone who's been with you and your co-op for a long part of your journey, um, my tip there is, is really just don't try and presume or second guess what their actual need is. You know, ask them and, and try and ask them to be as ex explicit as they can be about what it is they really want to engage with you on. Um, the other one, which I think we've already touched upon earlier, um, talking about direct phone calls and contact, is to address a member's immediate concerns. You know, whether a member comes to you face to face, whether it's by email or by a phone call, is they're, they're calling with a need about either a service or a product or some sort of interaction that they're going to have with you. And it's it's about really trying to boil down what it is um, that their concerns or their issue is there and making sure that you get it right first time. And if you're not able to, um, to, to, to sort that thing immediately, then it's going away and thinking about how, how can you do so because essentially other members are gonna have this concern as well. Thanks, Gareth. My top tips, first one, um, be really clear on why, why, why you're engaging people in something, um, particularly if that uh, is a KPI from up high in the organisation. So I've had many people contact me over the years about youth engagement. We need to engage the youth. And my, my first comeback is why? What, what are you going to engage them in? What's the purpose of it? Is it to improve? Uh, is it to because the board have told you to engage young people or is it because you want young people to do a very specific thing? Um, and so be really clear rather than just setting yourself engagement it, it, you know performance measures and all the rest of it to really work out why what's the point of it and if there isn't really an obvious point then don't be surprised if people don't want to engage in it um so young people being a good example is actually young people really do want to get involved in things where they can make a difference and make a change and they're not in, interested in getting engaged in things in a tokenistic way and so be really clear from the start why why should they care uh, about what you want to engage them in um, second tip for me is breaking breaking the membership meal into bite-sized pieces so you might have within your organization a, a, a big chunk of work or a big thing you want to engage members in and because you deal with it every single day day in day out it might not look that big or that that scary but it really is if somebody's new to your organization or doesn't even know your organization then engaging is, is a huge hurdle to get um, to go through so what can you do to break that up and make it less scary um, so just for example a tip might be if you know you're doing an event where uh, you want new members to join coming to a, an event on your own is really scary so can you get another member to give them a call and say I'll meet you outside and so they go into the room with another member or or other ways you can make the interaction or the initial interaction with you just less scary just smaller easier to do easier to to bite into so that's my two tips um, so now over to you really if you've got any uh, tips you want to raise you can either type them into the chat uh, or you can raise your hand and we'll call you out and you can share your tip on how to engage members or ways you found to engage members that's worked really really well so so put them in the chat or raise your hand and Irina will introduce you and uh, and also I'd, I'd really like to know um, from anyone um, what what are the kind of frustration parts in your organization that you'd really like to be able to nail from a mem member engagement point of view so i'll just um uh, let jane uh, come in to talk but have a think about it if you could and let and share with us if you can what are the the most difficult parts of your organization to put across is it the messaging let us know what's the most difficult part for you to uh, to to get over to your members and let's have a, a chat about that go ahead jane Unmute. Jane, can you hear me? I'm just trying to unmute you now. Okay. Okay. So, have, is that right? It is. Yes. Thanks. Okay. Sorry. So, I'll start again. Uh, my name is Jane Avery. I'm a director of Central England Co-op and also a co-owner 
of CASE, a cooperative that promotes other co-ops in Leicestershire. So, um, the, uh, so I think for me, meaningful membership, uh, the importance is meaningful. Uh, so looking at Central England Co-op, I think it, it's important to um, engage with members in different, uh, on different levels. So some members are members purely because we provide a need for people um, providing food in their locality and also funeral services and so on and so forth. So th and that is their engagement. Um, and, and that's fine, that's active membership and that's fine. And others want to be engaged and we want to engage with people on, on all levels. So I think variety for us at Central England Co-op is, um, is the key really to um, engaging with members um, and, it, and members engaging with us. So in this coronavirus, one of our um, drama groups has, you obviously have had to cancel what they were doing so that's um, cut back on their income and they have um, started doing quizzes online and that's brought in a lot more people to know about them who weren't particularly interested in drama maybe uh, but that's that's about being support and being cooperative so that's one example and um, there's been an engagement it's hard when it's a big co-op to engage with grassroots levels um, so that's just one point and the other point is from Case's point of view um, it's using uh, on the ground networks I think that I think there has to be a push and pull there has to be a, a, a reason for people to want to be members but that and some of that reasoning can be altruistic and some of it can be this is what I want what I need uh, and the co-op meets that economic need or social need or need in my community. Yeah, it's interesting, Jane. I wonder if I can ask a question in terms of um, your members. Do you think they, they get why you need members? Do you think that's important for you to get across? Is that, uh, is that something that you um, grapple over? Well, I think it's, I think that, uh, I think one of the first slides that um, John put up about that ladder of engagement was quite important. So a lot of people, um, uh, there are, there are degrees of involvement in membership. So I don't think it probably is very obvious to people um, when they are first engaging with the, with the co-op why membership is important and integral to being co-op and you know the difference between a good co-op and one that is a sort of a co-op in name only. Yeah does anyone else have any um, other experiences with um, members um, wanting to get members on board but then finding it difficult to express and, um, and just interpret why the need is great why you want a member and what to do with them. Do they know who they are? Do you know, um, do they know what a member is to you? Um, anybody else got any experiences of that that they want to share? John, do you want to come in? I just think if there's no more tips from anybody else, we could move on to the, the kind of Q&A surgery bit with our last. So this is what Irina mentioned before. Um, this is really your opportunity now uh, to really share any burning questions or, or trials and tribulations and issues you're working through at the moment. And you've got at least three membership people here on the line, but also everyone uh, in the webinar who might be able to help you with that. That, that question or that issue. So if you've got a, a question or an issue you want to raise, type it into the chat or, uh, or ask, uh, raise your hand and Irina can bring you into the conversation so you can explain what your question or your issue is. Thanks, Richard. Okay, so um, our biggest issue at the moment is obviously um, how we go forward in terms of holding AGMs at the moment because um, we've got a lot of we've got a lot of members from our housing cooperatives. Um, a lot of them are uh, elderly. They won't necessarily have the technology or the ability to 
um, go online and do virtual meetings. Um, so it's how do we move forward with anything like an AGM because uh, a few of our co-ops at the moment would be looking at holding their AGMs uh, in May. So um, we've, Courts UK has got a lot of uh, guidance on online which we can point you to after this session is finished on how to how to conduct what you can and can't do essentially. Um, everyone's rules uh, are different but uh, things around proxy voting or doing entirely online AGMs or essentially postponing AGMs. So we've got loads of advice and guidance which we could share with you. Uh, yeah, Gareth's put something up about how to do that. And, it, and, and it, like I say, it kind of depends on how your co-op's built. So for example, Co-ops UK can run uh, an entirely online AGM with online voting. And there are lots of options out there, whether it's Zoom or you can essentially, you can pay pay organizations to to run your AGM for you online. So it's perfectly, perfectly possible to do it if your rules allow you to hold uh, online AGMs. But like I say, our, our advice and guidance is there. Um, I didn't say this, but what you could always do is hold a meeting on the presumption that nobody comes and then you can postpone it, uh, which I know some people have, have done, which is not entirely uh, good practice, but it, but it does work if you physically have to have a physical meeting and there's nothing you can do about it. They've essentially just held it at the chair's house and uh, no one's gone and then they postpone it until a, a, a later date. But, but yeah, if you if you can do something else, uh, do and like I say, although our, our advice and guidance on on how to do it is uh, is online. Does that help at we, all, or can you do you know biggest, if you can do online ones? I think our biggest problem is that our cooperatives operate under the 1981 fully mutual cooperative rules, which virtually yeah. don't allow sort of meetings in a digital format. So meetings are, are technically supposed to be done face to face only. Yeah, and one of the things we're lobbying for at the moment and getting see, getting clarity on is how long uh, a society can postpone an AGM for, because I know that with the company legislation there, they're allowing companies to postpone them for longer periods. And at the moment, we're just getting clarity on how exactly how long a society can postpone it if it if physically can't, can't hold the meeting. Um, so if we'll, we'll make a note of yours and get back to you off, uh, offline about it. Okay, thank you. On yeah, the, the Q&A, sorry, I was just going to jump in because Alice um, has asked a question here. Can anyone give examples of how members participate in the organisations and their organisations, except for AGM votes? Um, this is what we struggle with in how, to, how do members participate, and that's a community farm running a veg box scheme. Um, you know, of course, um, well, I'd imagine you're still able to potentially run the, the veg box scheme. I know some community shops that do so. Uh, are still managing to do so it, it it's looking at your members and how they they can still feel part of what what it is you're doing i mean i know some community pubs have um still managed to run their quizzes and they're asking for for, for members to form smaller groups and they can essentially have their own quizzes together um <clears throat> Other members, such as I know, um, what was it? We, we talked about feeding things back to the website. Um, so engaging members, perhaps in a photo competition or something they can do at distance, so they still feel they have a connection and they're still able to be recognised and shown as as members doing things and participating with the society. So for the, this is the veg box. Um, it's breaking down all the all the things that you you need help and support with as, as an organization and then trying to work out whether engaging members with those issues will will help you out so it could be do 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 can you ask members for their engagement in the setting of your environmental policy and um for example or your policy on deliveries or, or any part of your business and what that doesn't mean is doing a huge long document sending it out to members, asking them to read, read a huge long document and comment on it. That's a lot of effort. Uh, but it might mean is polling your members through social media on some very specific questions about your environmental policy or, or, or whatever, and then essentially taking on board their views and feeding that back. And so it's, it's working out, you know, cooperatives and community benefit societies can, you've got all these members, you've got data on tap, you've got people who are loyal to your organization who will give you advice for free, um, which private companies tend to have to pay for. So really do think about how can you break down all the things you need to work through as a co-op, ask members in bite-sized ways, um, and then feed back to them what you did. So as a veg box, could you, could you get, um, get them to fill in a survey of what are the most popular veggies? 
and then that will inform your your uh, your priorities for what goes in the veg box. You know, it's really simple things like that. It doesn't have to be about voting at AGMs and elections. It could be asking their opinion on anything. And, and the crucial piece is as long as if you've asked their opinion for something, you you do the you say we did. You know, you said you wanted more carrots in your veg box, so we've done it. And 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 that kind of response to to any sort of member feedback makes people realise that what they what they what they what they gave you, you did something with. Um, we've got a few more um, comments to just go through quite quickly. I'll just bring Philip in um, very quickly, who I know has been waiting for a while. So just to unmute you, Philip. Thanks. Um, yeah, I just had a quick one, which was uh, kind of when we're thinking about member engagement at the moment, one of the things that we want to do is, is uh, tell them what we have been doing on their behalf and um, kind of for them during the COVID stuff in relation to kind of how it's been impacting them. And we've been trying to respond to that. So I just wondered if you had any advice about how you judge the tone of, on the one hand, sort of respecting that it is a crisis and the extent to which we've actually helped them when they might be really struggling personally and professionally is probably limited. Uh, but at the same time, wanting them to know that we have actually responded and done some things and kind of tried to be there for them during this time. Um, yeah, just sort of from a communications perspective, do you have any, have any advice about how to, how to judge that balance? Go ahead, Sean. I saw my colleagues pausing then. <laughs> I, it's a really difficult one because members, people are all different. And I suppose as a, if you're involved in membership, you try to build an insight into the sorts of members you've got. And so I know at Co-ops UK, we've got a fairly robust set of members who have high expectations, but equally we can be fairly robust with them back, we tend to find. And so I'm always of the view that you're, you're open and honest with your members about uh, both your faults and where you've made mistakes or when they've missed something that they that you did send them in an email or all that sort of thing so I'm, I'm personally of the opinion that I tend to be open and honest with members and and people give you the benefit of the doubt and people tend to respect openness and honesty yeah and I, Philip did you mention what sort of organization you're from Oh, am I still? Oh, sorry. I thought I didn't realize I was unmuted still. Um, yeah, I'm from Community Energy England, which means that I'm more like Commute Co-op UK than I am about one of your co-op members, perhaps. Um, so I'm sort of asking from a, a smaller peer, really, rather than one of your members' perspective mm. as such. But yeah. And um, and do you feel that you've got a um, a kind of a clear line on why you need members, and you can express that to them? Um, clearly or do you feel that's that's an area that you need to work on um definitely something we want to refine the way we mm. present ourselves but we certainly have um a really established message about why our members are really important to us kind of particularly from the representative perspective in the sense that we call ourselves the voice of their sector so that's that we need their membership to um to justify how we advocate on their behalf so we're sort of a a um, uh, feedback loop in the sense that uh, we we think they need us to help them get a supportive policy environment just as we need them um, to justify our existence and, and the voice that we have but it, sort of within that context responding to the covid stuff we've we've done it from that angle but it's just I, we don't want to kind of shout about it and say aren't we amazing because of all these things we've done for you and this is why you should stay a member it seems like trading on a really kind of awful situation that some of them might be finding extremely difficult to to make ourselves look good mm -hmm. yeah um, I, go ahead Jan. i was gonna say i'm conscious we've we're kind of running over so i'm thinking um we're quite happy to stay on the line and carry on q and a's and conversations with people uh past 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 four o'clock um so, but if you do have to duck out, duck out early. Uh, and just to say, if you do have to duck out, we will be sharing all the tips and, and, and answer questions afterwards. And there will be a, a, feed, a feedback form that goes out. Um, but I'm quite happy to stay on and, and carry on with some, answering some questions. If that's, and if you're happy to stay on, do stay on. Um, I saw a question from Mid Counties, I think it was, about engaging young people. Um, I suppose just to say, I go back to the point I mentioned before is particularly with young people, be really clear what you want to engage them with and, and what's in it for them. And equally, because 
you know, uh, young people expect results pretty quickly. So again, structure your engagement around things that you can realistically respond to very quickly because they're not going to wait three months for a consultation to be over and you to get back to them. So um, try to manage their and your expectations around the sorts of things you can engage them with because you know you can ask them, you can poll them, you can have a workshop and you know fairly quickly you can get back to them with the results or what you're going to do about it. And if it's a, if it's a big issue that you know you're not going to be able to respond to them very, very quickly about, then just try to be mindful of that and try to think of ways you can shorten the gap between getting their opinion on something and feeding back to them. And equally, th you know, real things you know I've, I'll, um, we did a great workshop a few years ago from uh, by a young person about how to engage them and they were very passionate and they were very passionate about uh, social change and and the world and but they wanted it grounded in, in how it would affect them as, as young people um so yeah yep just just on that as well with young people um we have seen and also um provided fairly good and engaging uh, discussions with business colleges, um, further education business colleges, and then you've got a group of about 80 or so young people all thinking they're going to listen to a, a business um, related PowerPoint and then they start to unravel this almost secret um, about cooperatives and that's a really good way of um, engaging uh, with young people in the business uh, education sector. Just to jump on that um, towards the end, um, when thinking about those strategies, also be thinking about the platforms and the tools that you're going to use to try and engage with young people. Um, I know in speaking to a, a co-op a couple of years ago, they said that they were they were looking at how they engaged and tried to bring in more young people that would engage with what they do, but also then potentially become members. And one of the simplest ways that they 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 understood this was asking a younger member and saying, you know, what is it you you glean from your membership, your interactions with us. They ended up then passing them their um, Facebook account and they allowed them to post and use that for the week. And I think that helped them to understand their how young people wanted to be talked to. And with John saying about getting some of those instant um, um, you know, comebacks, rewards, as it were, from that engagement with them. Yeah. And the other thing I would say about um, particularly engaging young people or new new audiences is you could have a fantastic journey around something particularly aimed at them as an audience. And then if at the end of that journey, there's kind of this hard stop and they just enter the normal relationship or no, normal experience, that's a, a key point that they'll leave and or get disengaged. And so I suppose the analogy could be, you could engage your young people in a really fantastic, exciting activity and game or whatever. And then they come to their first member meeting and it's a really boring meeting done in a very old fashioned way, they're not going to come to a second meeting. So some of some of the engagements about how how do you take the best bits of how you've tried to engage a new audience and try and bring those things into the mainstream ways you engage members, because to be honest, your normal members will be will be will be usually be happy for you to improve and uh, improve the ways you engage engage them. So, yeah, do more do more of your normal meetings the way young people might like meetings. Okay. We have got just one comment. I think it will be worth just finishing on, if we can. Um, Tanya Noon, we've been surprised how many older members have engaged by digital means, um, from a Tai Chi group to creative writing groups. I think we need to embrace this and offer more training. It's a really good point, isn't it? And I think I've been surprised as well. When the needs must, um, the older generation actually will put the time in to engage and have seen the, the great value in it. So yes, thanks, Tanya, for that. Um, we're struggling with engagement with surveys during COVID-19. Uh, we've done that one, I think. I have a question regarding the strategies to try and engage younger people, thank you. Um, I think we've, we're coming to the end of it now. So unless there's any other comments or hands up from anybody else, if you do want to say something, please do. Um, we're just wrapping up. Anybody else want to discuss the final points, John? Not from me, I don't think. Gareth, any final comments? Um, I think we've, we've covered quite a lot in a short space of time there. Um, I know we've already said about members getting in touch with us, uh, certainly 
you know, we're talking about engagement here and we want to hear from members, whether it's COVID related or it's membership related, we still want to hear you. So um, yeah, just a, a call to say, do get in touch if there's anything you need in future.